Again, uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Lisa Hall. I do serve as the branch president for the NWCP uh, New Bedford branch. We are so happy to have all of you with us this evening for our statewide legislation in Dartmouth High School Indian Forum and discussion. Tonight's forum and discussion will feature uh, several folks, but mainly our guest speaker, Jean-Luc Pierre. He is the president, uh, board of directors for North American Indian Center of Boston. We're so happy to have Jean-Luc with us here. He'll be speaking shortly. I've also invited um, the entire uh, Dartmouth School Committee, along with uh, Superintendent Dr. Bonnie Gifford, uh, several members of the school committee could not make it, but I'm happy that we have Dr. Shannon Jenkins uh, here from the Dartmouth School Committee. Uh, other Dartmouth School members uh, have made it very clear that they wish to be here tonight, uh, including uh, Mary Waite, um, as well um, as Kathleen Amaral, but they had other uh, appointments, but they did say they wish they could have been here. Uh, Chair Chris Oliver was not able to make it along with Mr. John Noons and, and Dr. Gifford could not make it. So we thank the Dartmouth School Committee for at least responding to us and totally appreciate that. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started at this time. Uh, tonight is about a discussion around statewide legislation around Native American mascots. There are several bills um, in the House, but it's also a discussion on what the NAACP New Bedford branch has done up until this point around this discussion. And just as a short recap, uh, last year, the Dartmouth School Committee engaged with several community organizations and local activists, including the NAACP, around holding a public hearing around the high school mascot, which is the, uh, which is the Indian. Um, at that time, there were public uh, meetings that were had, there were discussions being had, and ultimately a vote did come uh, at three to two to not have uh, discussions around uh, the Dartmouth High School Indian. As you all know, over the last several weeks, however, this discussion has reemerged at the national level as the NFL football team, uh, the Washington Redskins, has been under uh, strict scrutiny to change their mascot around as well as companies like uh, Uncle Ben and products Aunt Jemima and Lando, Lando Lakes Maiden, critics have called for them to also change this offensive language and product. Uh, so tonight we wanna have a discussion. Again, we're happy to have John Luke with us uh, to talk about the bills at uh, the Massachusetts state, state level and then have a conversation around the Dartmouth High School Indian as well. Tonight will be about a respectful conversation, having everyone to share their viewpoints, allowing for people to also be educated and informed on the discussion. So the format will be that we'll have speakers, we'll allow for one or two questions after each speaker, and then at the end of our program, we'll allow questions for all of our guests, uh, if that makes sense for everybody, okay? So at this time, I'm more than happy to have John Luke with us president here of the North American Indian Center. Please, John Luke, thank you for being here. All right, and just, uh, just clock check, how, how many um, minutes do I have on this? Yeah, I, I would say feel free to speak for five to 10, because I know you're gonna talk about the bill. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Time, please. Um, yeah, so a uh, bit of housekeeping before I start. I'm calling in uh, from Jamaica Plain here in the greater Boston area. We recognize it as the traditional indigenous territory of the Massachusetts nation uh, who survive into this day uh, in part through their lineal descendants, the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog. Uh, myself, uh, like many of you, um, where, where you are, uh, I am a guest on these lands. Uh, I am a member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. I'm originally from New Orleans. I've uh, been living and working in, in the Boston area since 2013. And my name is Jean-Luc Pierrette. Um, so in uh, 2017, I got involved uh, with the North American Indian Center of Boston on the, on the board level. 
We are uh, Massachusetts' oldest urban Indian uh, center. Uh, we are now in our 50th year of service uh, to the New England Native American community. Um, we first started with meetings in 1969 and then were incorporated as the Boston Indian Council in 1970. In 1976, uh, Boston Indian Council was recognized as a liaison uh, between the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, and residents of tribes who had historic government to government relationships with uh, Massachusetts, uh, but who are now outside of the current borders. Uh, for example, uh, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet and Mickamaw. Um, and for the past uh, few years, we've actually been um, part of a coalition uh, in terms of advocacy on the state level for um, establishing a statewide Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, changing the state flag and seal, uh, also prohibiting uh, mascots in uh, Massachusetts public schools. Uh, but in more recent years, when we uh, solidified the coalition around what's called the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda, we included uh, a bill that proposed a commission specifically on the education of American Indian Alaska Native students within the Commonwealth, uh, and also uh, an act to protect uh, Native American heritage, which would seek to refine the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act uh, enforcement to include all public entities uh, within Massachusetts, regardless of whether they received federal funding or not, uh, with the aim of keeping uh, sacred funerary objects uh, and human remains out of auction houses. Uh, most recently, uh, there was a case uh, with the town of Medford uh, deacquisitioning uh, sacred objects from the Pacific Northwest and then uh, giving them to Skinner auctioneers to auction off to raise funds to improve the, uh, the public library. Um, NACOB uh, submitted a, a, com a public statement about this. Uh, the town solicitor got involved and, and, and those objects were thankfully pulled, but that spoke to the need uh, for that piece of legislation uh, here in Massachusetts. Uh, but particular uh, to tonight's conversation is the, is the ban on, on Native mascots in, in public schools. Um, and the legislation itself, as it was uh, originally submitted, uh, named uh, the harm of Native mascots uh, specifically. Um, and also had a clause which uh, allowed for uh, tribes within Massachusetts uh, to protect their identities in, in certain ways. So, uh, you know, tribes would not be barred from using their own identity uh, to identify like their, their athletic teams if, if they were so chose. But then they would also have the affirmation of, uh, you know, it's the affirm affirmation of their own sovereignty um, by the ability to enter into formal agreements uh, with school boards, with, um, with individual public schools, in order for that tribe to agree for its, uh, for its identity to be used uh, in, a, in a sports team name. And I think that that kind of actually speaks to why specifically their, you know, native mascots are, are problematic on, on a government to government basis is that uh, there are instances uh, and, and in large part uh, there are instances uh, where tribes are not formally entering into agreements with school boards, uh, with public schools in order to uh, allow their, uh, their identity to be used um, and in, in, in a respectful way. Um, I did want to also uh, t like mention uh, earlier today, uh, the Massachusetts Senate actually uh, unanimously uh, passed a resolution which uh, would approve a commission uh, relative to the state seal and motto of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 
Uh, the seal itself, uh, for those on the call who are not aware, uh, features a composite of a Native American man. Uh, and I say composite uh, because this involves the, the head of Thomas Littleshell on top of a body uh, that is modeled uh, after a skeleton uh, of a Massachusetts person that was excavated in an archeological dig um, and then dressed uh, with the sash of Poe Metacomet, who was the indigenous leader that led uh, the War of Resistance, uh, commonly known as King Philip's War, fought 345 years ago uh, here in um, what we now know as Massachusetts. So uh, the reason why, um, you know, that war is central to the need to address the, the state seal and especially the, the, the way, the gruesome way in which that, that native figure is composited, even before we get to the disembodied sword and, and a disembodied arm and the sword of Miles Standish uh, being brandished above the head of the native figure, um, is that, you know, focusing on King Philip's War, one, uh, there were uh, internment camps on Boston Harbor Islands, in which at least a thousand graves are out there between Deer Island and Long Island. Um, two, uh, the head of King, uh, King Philip himself was beheaded. His head was placed on a pike and it was on display for at least 25 years following the war. Uh, but then three, and one thing that I, I, that I never let people forget, is that uh, coming out of that war uh, was a law called the Boston Indian Imprisonment Act. And this was a, uh, this was a law that stayed on the books until 15 years ago, until 2005, uh, which made it illegal for Native Americans to walk the streets of Boston unescorted unless they would be subject to uh, imprisonment. Um, and it took, you know, decades for our elders in our community uh, to organize and to um, to really push uh, for that for that civil rights issue. Uh, but it wasn't until 2005, and it wasn't until uh, it was a journalist of color uh, conference uh, saw it as an issue recognize that there were journalists within its constituency that would be affected by this law, being that they were American Indian. Uh, and they went to the city of Boston, they went to the uh, Commonwealth, and they said, look, you know, if you do not take this law uh, off the books, uh, we're going to pull our conference from Boston. And what that would mean is a loss of, you know, $45 million of economic impact. Uh, shortly thereafter, the law was taken off the books. Um, so I, I, I say that, you know, and I say, you know, one thing that was pointed out earlier today, um, uh, I think by, by David uh, specifically, was that this uh, seal and motto bill has been in the legislature since 1985. Uh, and it has been from, uh, through the leadership of Representative Byron Rushing, formerly, um, that you know, this, this, this law ha had continued uh, to be entered into the legislature. Um, so definitely, and of course, you know, the indigenous community itself uh, has been active in advocating uh, for these issues, such as the seal and motto, such as banning on native mascots, such as uh, statewide Indigenous Peoples Day, but then also um, what could be framed as more substantive um, issues that you know actually you know directly address systemic change. Talking about uh, the Special Commission on Education, uh, talking about uh, the disruption of theft from BIPOC communities even after death when we're talking about protecting Native American heritage and making sure that our sacred objects, funerary objects, and, and human remains stay out of auction houses. Um, so these are things that we have been active on, that we are very vocal on, we have organizational support on, 
we rely very heavily on our on our allies um and just you know kind of food for thought please you know um kind of wait for like after this call but i did want to uh, enter into the chat uh this op-ed written by um the navajo um uh journalist uh jacqueline keeler uh from streetroots.org uh which asserts you know what uh hashtag not your mascot owes to black lives matter um so it again it continues um you know taking that national conversation around the name of the washington nfl team but then you know definitely tying it to uh the movement of black lives matter and acknowledging that it is through our solidarity uh, with our, our Black and Indigenous people of color uh, relations uh, that these issues are going forward. So this is not something that we are, uh, we, we will allow the politics of division to enter into the conversation. This is something that we are doing hand in hand. Uh, we are reconciling the, um, the identities of, of our public institutions and and the systems that uh, the social systems that sort of like inform the way we move through this world uh, at the same time while you know definitely advocating for that radical and needed change so thank you for the time and uh look forward to everybody's questions thank you uh john lu truly appreciate your comment thank you so much for being here again and at this time, we'll allow for one question and then we'll move on to uh, Dr. Shannon Jenkins. Is there one question that anyone has right now that's pressing for Jean-Luc? If not, I'll give you a couple seconds to unmute yourself. And if not, we'll prepare for, for Dr. Shannon Jenkins. Hi, can you hear me at all, anybody? Yes. Uh, um, I, I don't know, I'm kind of bad with technology. My name is Tim Dunn, I'm with the Standard Times. I just, um, I got the press release about this today. Um, so I, I joined in halfway through a Gene, uh, is Gene Luke, is that how you pronounce your name, sir? Um, I, my name is uh, Jean-Luc Curie. Jean-Luc, okay, thank you very much. Um, I was able to join in um, midway through the, um, your uh, conversation, and um, I just, I didn't know if you guys had anything, have done anything relative to uh, Dartmouth Mass, potentially. I know Dartmouth at their high school, they wanted to change, um, there's been the Indian's logo, that's what this is about. Have you guys done anything, um, reached out to any uh, bodies of government yet, or anything like that? We are uh, we are in support of the uh, the local organizing uh, committee here, and you know as uh, as needed, we're able to uh, provide uh, comments to like the school board or, or the town council. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know it's it's a uh, it's an issue of you know the, the poll. So you know we our our focus right. specifically is on. Um, the state level um, ban on native mascots. So this is something that, you know, certainly we are open to town to town advocacy. Um, and this is something that has been fought town to town, but definitely we are, um, our main focus is on the, the uh, statewide legislation. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. That helps Wonderful. Thank you. And, and, and as you were talking about a local group, there are some people that I want to thank really quickly before we hear from Dr. Shannon Jenkins, I certainly just want to uh, certainly thank uh, Gretchen Baker-Smith. Thank you for your help in organizing this. David Ahrens, thank you for your help. Uh, Dr. Janet Freeman, thank you for your help. Diane Gilbert, certainly thank you for your help. Elizabeth Murphy, certainly thank you for your help in organizing. Grateful uh, Michael Watson and Brooke Worley. Thank you again for all those who helped to, to put this together. It's important to know that the NWCP is working with a team of folks. So I just want to truly thank you. At this time, we will hear from Dr. Shannon Jenkins, who's a Dartmouth uh, School Committee member. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins, for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me, Dr. Hall. Um, I don't have a lot to say tonight. Um, I'm mostly here to listen to your all comments um, and to engage with you. Um, but I'll just say a few words uh, as we get started having this conversation. Um, I am personally opposed to the mascot. Um, I have been for quite a while. I am grateful for all of you, for all of your activism. Um, I'm getting teared up, but I feel like it's been great to get all of your emails um, in support of this action. Um, as Dr. Hall talked about, 
last spring we had this conversation and I was quite shocked and stunned that we did not even have a community conversation about this. Um, I know that a lot of you have been involved in organizing to contact the committee. That issue came back up again um, at the last meeting. I think Mr. Ahrens was watching. I think he did a summary of this meeting for you all. Um, I would say things have changed maybe a little, but there is still work to be done. Um, two of the committee members, myself and Ms. Waite, who could not be here tonight, she had some training as a new school board member, um, are both opposed we've, on record um, to the use of the Indian as a mascot. Um, we both would like to see it go. Um, one committee member is a firm vote for keeping the, uh, uh, the, the current mascot, and I would say um, that there are two committee members who are potentially open to persuasion and at our last meeting um, they said as part of a broader diversity committee that they would be willing to start engaging in this conversation. Um, I would say that your actions matter um, and that continuing to contact the school committee and letting them know that um, where you stand that there are people in this community um, opposed to this is quite effective. Um, and I would ask for you to continue to advocate on this matter. Um, I am here to answer any questions you might have about this process. This is not really about me speaking. It's about me listening to you and, and learning from you and um, maybe us coming up with some ideas. So I will sort of stop there and, you know, listen to what everyone has to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. Totally appreciate you and your comment. At this time, we'll take one question for Dr. Jenkins, if there's anyone who has a question for Dr. Jenkins at this time, as we prepare for Dr. Laurel Davis Delano to speak next. Any questions for Dr. Jenkins? Yes, I have a question. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, when would be the next point at which the school committee might discuss the possibility of uh, allowing this discussion to take place? That's a good question, um, Dr. Rose. It's good to see you. I feel like I haven't, even if it's only virtual, mm -hmm. like I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, at the next meeting, um, part of the reason why the conversation about this was a little bit um, stunted at our last meeting is because the topic of the mascot was not on the public agenda. And I do feel it is very important to inform the public of what we're going to be talking about when we have that conversation. Um, at the next meeting, which I will have to look at my calendar, I'll put that in the chat when I do that, um, we will be um, convening and creating the diversity committee that will look at that. So we will be creating the charge for that committee. We will be determining the membership of that committee. Um, I believe our next meeting is Monday, which I think is the 3rd of August. Um, the information about accessing that um, meeting is, uh, it should be available on the school, the school website, I believe. Um, we also, during the meeting, because of this weird pandemic Zoom thing, um, the mechanism for public comment during the meeting is to email the secretary during the meeting. So, you can email directly to her in advance and say, I would like this entered as public comment for the meeting, or you can email her during the meeting. Again, I will also, I'll put her email in the chat so you all know that. Um, but that is a way to, I think, strongly advocate for the committee taking up the issue of the mascot sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, and then I'll give one more. I think, John Luke, I think you had a question. Then we'll move on to Dr. Uh, Dave Solano. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pose a quick question to Dr. Jenkins because of the, uh, the question that, that I was um, given. I just wanted to clarify like any barriers uh, to interaction with local government or the, or the school committee because uh, NACOB is in Jamaica Plain. Uh, would we need to be sponsored uh, to to enter comment or you know be invited to to the meeting? It, are there any barriers to us submitting comment uh, on this issue? So right now we are doing comment via email. Um, we are not doing comment via 
this sort of discussion. I would like to see a broader discussion of that. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm not the dictator. I'm only one of five votes. Um, I think, Jean-Luc, you, you sort of also, I think, raised some points that I want to just elaborate on that's a little off topic. So you'd have to submit for public comment via email. Um, Keith, thank you. Just put the agenda and all of that um, in the comments. Um, I have been told in the past that there is an agreement, right, with local tribes, and I'm going to use air quotes purposefully around that, um, with a local tribe over the use of this mascot. Um, I have not been able to find any public record of such agreement. Um, it seems to be that former administrators, former school committee members talked to a few people who went to Dartmouth High School who were also members of tribes, not necessarily tribes for whom Dartmouth is their native lands. Um, and that is what they point to as agreement. After our first round of sort of trying to have this discussion, I did some personal research and found some local tribes, obviously tribal boundaries don't coincide with our town boundaries. And I think that, I think, I don't know, I'm not an expert here, that parts of Dartmouth may have been parts of different sort of tribal lands. And so I tried to reach out to those tribes. Um, unsurprisingly, I've said this at our last meeting, um, they weren't really willing to talk to us because we just held a vote that said, we don't want to talk to you, right? And personally, if someone had just said, I don't want to talk to you, I'm, I'm not sure I would invest my time and energy in that. Um, I'm hopeful to follow back around and I've already sort of written down your name and your organization's information um, to start make some more of those connections as we move forward with this discussion. Sorry, that was kind of a long and rambly answer to your question. Um, but part of it is I will be in touch with you to, to follow up on this. Great. Thank you so much, jean -Luc, and thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. Please hope you'll be able to stick around uh, for the rest of the program. At this time, I'm elated and happy to have Dr. Laurel Davis Delano, who will bring brief remarks as well. Doc, Dr. Davis Delano, thank you. Uh, I think you're on mute. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Wait, am I unmuted? Oh, you're good to go now. Okay. Um, are there any other native speakers that want to speak before me? Yeah, the only other person we had invited to speak was uh, uh, Megan Running Deer Page, and she uh, was not able to attend. Okay, um, so I'm not native. Um, I do work with native scholars, though. I I've been um, studying the mascot issue for over 25 years, and I've also been involved in it. I'm a professor of sociology. Um, I maintain an email list of both Native and non-Native scholars who study representations of Native Americans, including mascots and other things. Um, so uh, you may or may not know at this meeting that this week there are um, three uh, school committee meetings in other Massachusetts towns where they're talking and hopefully tonight voting on uh, mascot issues. And so I'm part of the Massachusetts Mascot Coalition, which is connected to Jean-Luc um, and the indigenous uh, legislative agenda. And we have speakers that are at these other meetings, including tonight. Um, so you don't have them, but you know, essentially because you're not a school committee except for one person here. Um, but if you bring this to the school committee, the um, Massachusetts Mascot Coalition can line up some speakers for you. Um, we currently have five Native nations that from Massachusetts that have signed on to the mascot bill and some of those folks speak and we have um, some other speakers. Um, my own angle is that recently I, I've done, I've had numerous publications on the mascot issue, um, but um, very recently I worked with two other scholars, Joseph Gohn and Stephanie Freiberg, from Harvard and um, uh, University of Michigan to summarize all the research, um, published research, academic research, that's on the effects of native mascots. So mostly the media and many towns, what they focus on is opinion. You know, this group says this, this other group says this. Well, what are the actual fa facts on the ground? When, you know, you're a school and the other people that we're talking about, we're not really talking about the proteins here, are schools. And so the goal is education, right? 
And most educational um, decision makers, including principals and superintendents and school committees, they look at the research findings when they're making educational decisions. And those educational decisions, you know, they look at what math curriculum proves to be most effective and so forth. Um, and so unfortunately on this issue, in many places, that is not the focus. And so our article and what I'm gonna say tonight is that focus. Like what are the consequences in terms of education for the mascots? So there's two sets of research findings. The first one is effects, like direct effects on native people, okay? Um, and basically overall, the research shows that the mascot, native mascots create a hostile climate for native people. Um, and, and some of the specific findings are that exposure, even for native youth that don't have an issue with the mascots, it lowers their self-esteem after exposed to native mascots. It reduces their ability to imagine potential future selves, okay, exposure to native mascots. It also reduces the sense that native youth think that their native communities can effectively address things, okay? And it also, in a completely different study, two different studies, shows that it really increases the negative feelings of native young people in terms of um, the emotions of just general stress, distress, depression, dysphoria, and hostility. And in one study, it showed that native, native young people are less apt to obtain, uh, go to athletic events um, or want to go to athletic events when there are native mascots there. Um, a bigger body of research in terms of effects focuses on the effects of non-native people. And we might think that this is unrelated to native people, but if there are negative effects on that are related to Native people on non-Native people, this can translate into um, effects on Native people. Um, so those studies show that Native mascots um, are associated with negative thoughts and stereotypes of Native Americans. They most importantly show that when non-Native people are exposed to Native mascots, this increases their stereotyping of Native Americans. Um, so, and there's even some studies that show that supporters of native mascots are um, compared to people who oppose them. Um, supporters tend to hold more prejudice and stereotyping of native people. A couple studies found that exposure to native mascots increases the tendency to discriminate against native people. Um, so overall, these findings show two things. The first one is that exposing non-native people to native mascots in increases the chances that they're going to do harmful things that then have a negative effect on native people. But in terms of like educational issues, there's another effect. Basically, the mascots are un not educationally sound. I mean, we want people to learn things that are not prejudicial, that are accurate, that are not stereotypical. And the research is showing that non-native people from native mascots are learning things that aren't educationally sound. Um, so, um, you know, there's a bunch of reasons why the native mascots have these effects and I can talk about these if you want. Um, the, you know, the mascots are, tend to be homogenous, um, you know, like not differentiating among native individuals and native groups. They tend to mostly be selected to be warriors and male. They trap native people in past rather than focusing on contemporary native people. Um, so that's all I have to say about the research findings. But um, you know, I I am I, I've also uh, have a separate publication that's about strategy at the local level, and I usually offer myself up to groups of people that are working for change to have small, not public meetings like this, um, to discuss strategy, um, what works and, and what doesn't work. So if um, there's a small number of you that wanna do that, I'm happy to do that. And I'm sorry for talking over five minutes if I did. 
So, no worries. Th thank you, Dr. David Zeleno. Truly appreciate it. Um, we'll get ready for our uh, one of our students. But before that, is there one question for uh, Dr. David Zeleno? Okay, wonderful. If not, I'm so excited. Uh, for many of you who may not know, the NAACP New Bedford branch, we work with many youth in the area. We have a NAACP UMass Dartmouth chapter at UMass, as well as in our own branch, we have the NAACP Youth Council. And we have uh, several students that from our youth council uh, that attend Dartmouth High School. And so tonight I've invited Alexia Ash, who's a student at Dartmouth High School, to really just come and give her perspective. I think it's essential to hear from many different folks um, around this issue. And we always wanna make sure that we are listening to our youth and listening to students. So I just ask Alexia to come and just talk, give her opinion and, and feel comfortable knowing that she has an audience. So Alexia, thank you so much for being here. Hi, so um, I personally think that is very insensitive uh, towards Native Americans. Um, I am a student athlete. I am a cheerleader actually. And throughout the years, I've noticed that some of the cheers have some things that were a bit um, strange. There was things where we holler and put this motion, I'm not sure what it's called, over our mouths. Um, it's just a lot of things that I don't think should be included in, um, like, yeah. <laughs> um, but when it comes to changing the mascot, um, I am for it, but I feel as if we need something that isn't degrading towards Dartmouth. Because if you look at um, if you look at the schools around us, we have the Whalers and the Bears. And there was about two years ago, I heard a rumor about um, the school system changing it to the Dartmouth Ducks, and um, I feel like that is just very like it's inferior to the other mascot. But I think that, uh, I think, um, I think um, if Dartmouth would like to keep um, Indians, that they should uh, keep it, they should, like, the visual mask, like, Moors and or from their culture, or if they choose to keep the Native American part, like of the um, visual perspective, then they should change the name from the Indians to the Native Americans to include um, the Native American culture and give them the respect that they deserve and not have them um, demonetized and have them um, confused with Indians. I'm not sure if that made sense. <laughs> I think it did. Thank, thank you, Alexa. I appreciate that. Uh, is there, yep, no, thank you for being here. Appreciate you. Uh, I was going to ask for a question, but Shannon is putting me up early. So go ahead, your question. I just want to um, encourage. So I want to say to, I'm so excited that you brought the youth from the NAACP in, and particularly students from Dartmouth. Um, the committee that is going to look at the mascot is also going to look at broader issues of diversity. Um, I think we know that, I mean, everyone can do better, but I think in particular Dartmouth, there's a lot of issues that Dartmouth High School and the other schools um, in the community need to address. So I would like to encourage the members of your youth council, um, if they are interested and would be willing to work on some of these issues with us, um, to please contact me. I will put my information, my email address in the chat because um, I think it's so important to have our students at the table because only they really know what's going on. So please, I encourage you to, um, to, to contact me and let me know if you're interested in, in joining us in this conference. Wonderful, thank you so, so much. And we're gonna have our, our last speaker, which is Amanda Kufo. Uh, and then after that, we'll have open up for some discussion and questions uh, to everyone. I've invited uh, Amanda Kufo, who is a recent graduating senior from uh, UMass Dartmouth, also a member of our education committee chaired by Charlamagne Rathmi. 
I asked her to come and speak as Amanda Kufo when she was in high school. She also worked on this uh, at her and at her high school. So Amanda, please feel free to begin your comments. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me. Um, sorry for not showing my face. Um, my camera does not work, but we'll just have to do with this. Um, but thank you guys for inviting me and thank everyone for sharing their stories and their thoughts and opinions. Um, for me, I don't really have anything to say, but just explaining my experience um, being a high school student uh, with a mascot. Um, our mascot was, I went to high school in Tewksbury, Massachusetts, um, and their mascot is the Redmen. And we we had a various various amount of things in that you know, um, that school. So for one, the mascot was the Redmen, but we also had football players, cheerleaders wearing Native American headdresses. Um, they would have the paint face paints on their face, um, and they would do the chants. I forgot what chants they did, but they made very they made a lot of chants during touchdowns and things like that. Um, they would say things like Redmond on the war path. Um, and so it was very evident how rooted, especially in the sports teams, um, the, the Native American mascot was in. Uh, for Tewksbury, the controversy actually started with a few moms in the town who, who thought this was very offensive um, and brought it to the school committee. There was a huge controversy over it. Um, a, a lot of town debates and controversial things in high school. There was, everyone was split whether you were for the mascot or not. Um, and I was class president at that time. So I was definitely asked to, you know, share my opinion and my thoughts on it. And I didn't know much about Native American mascots, what's Native American culture, honestly, um, or indigenous culture. And so I did a lot of research. And on, as soon as I went to just look up Redmond, that alone just showed me that that was um, inappropriate and racist. Um, and so as I kept you know, looking into the history, I realized this was very offensive, but majority of the school and the majority of the town wanted to keep it. And you would hear arguments from, we've had this for 50 years, it's never been a problem, it's a part of our history, natives aren't offended, why are you all offended? Um, and it, it, it kind of made it seem like it was rooted in their identity in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so people would really be offended. Um, and there was a whole campaign where people were making t-shirts with the Native American mascot on their shirts saying, we need to keep the logo, um, we need to keep the mascot. Um, and it became so controversial that a lot of high school students even feared speaking up. Um, so there was this one town hall where we had where we basically just kind of had people come up and share their opinions and thoughts. And I just found it very odd. Um, for a lot of you who don't know, Tewksbury is majority um, a white town. It's about 98% white. Um, and I found it very interesting that there was no Native American to come to this town hall, to come speak. Um, it just seemed like town people who just wanted to share their opinions. Um, and so I just thought it was best to go reach out to tribes around the town. Um, and I found some people in the Wampanoag tribe um, and invited them to come. And they actually, they actually came, we met before, just to update them on the town and what's been going on. Um, and so when I, it was my turn to speak, I just shared a little bit. Um, I shared a little bit about what I had to say and then just gave the mic to the native person that I invited. Um, the native person didn't even get to speak at all. Um, I think she said her name and the whole auditorium just went ballistic. Um, they started throwing, um, they threw papers at her, they threw water bottles at me, um, they threw t-shirts, they said, go back home, you don't belong here. It was very interesting because we're literally talking about them and for, for, no, for no one to want someone who's native to come speak was very interesting because on the other side, there were people who were claiming to be native. Um, I'm sure they're two percent Cherokee somewhere, um, but the Native American um, person I invited was not allowed to speak at all. She was actually harassed, um, and eventually we had the school officers have to like direct us out, um, and she was just never allowed to speak. Uh, and she really felt just dis extremely discriminated against, um, and very disappointing to really see for myself. Um, I was called the N-word, I was called a uh, sex slave, uh, 
I had private messages on Facebook saying that I would get raped for my opinion. Um, it was very serious. People were taking this as if you were hurting their own identity. Um, and it got to the point where I had to have police escorts sometimes at school um, because I was the only student that spoke up that day. Um, and so it was very evident that I was against this. Um, I eventually lost the president seat towards the end of the year. Um, of course, with the stance that I made, it was very um, political and a lot of people did not agree. Uh, this became a Republican versus liberal conversation as well. Um, and it just seemed like one thing that people are saying, hey, we don't appreciate this. And people just made it so political. People wanted to make statements out of it. Um, I had my house TP'd. I've had my house egged before because of it. Um, so my family was, my family itself also was very harassed just for that political statement, um, which I don't even think it's political. I think it's moral um, that I made. And so I just had the personal experience just being 16 years old, seeing how people treat others, um, how opinions are treated, how the Native American conversation around mascots and logos is still so controversial. And I mean, to this day, I still don't understand it, but I think just from the high school perspective that I had, it's very hard for the high school students to really speak up. Um, to really say what they want to say because it becomes more than a school issue, becomes a town issue, it becomes a political issue, a moral issue. Um, and so I really do encourage um, whoever's on here, honestly, who has the power and the um, seat at the table to really do listen to the students, um, those who really had to build up a lot of courage to even speak up um, and to protect students too because because the town was majority um, for keeping the mascot, even the officers that I was escorted to school with barely were looking at me. Um, honestly, barely followed me. I could have walked to the bathroom or went somewhere and they would have never noticed I was gone. Um, so I guess that was just my experience. It was very traumatic. Um, and for me, it really just exposed me to social justice. And that was my first experience. And really what it looks, the ugly side of doing this work, the ugly side of um, doing social justice work. And ever since then, I've really actually been more into it. Um, I bet people wanted me out of it, but uh, ever since then, I, I've really been more into it and decided to go to UMass Dartmouth and major in political science and philosophy. And I actually just graduated. Um, and I, I really, after this, I really just been wanting to do more work around this. And I really do think that the conversation around this right now, the years ago, it seemed like no one wanted to listen. Um, to really hear now that the Washington uh, football team is now, um, has now changed their name and a lot of other companies are changing their name, the conversation is coming back up. Um, I'm really excited to see if we can, you know, keep pushing this forward and bring this to the forefront. Uh, and I guess an update with that town too, with all this that has been going on, that town actually brought that conversation back up again. Um, and there's been a petition going around. And it seems like the petition to change it um, has about, I think, 4,000 signatures, whereas the one to keep it has like 200. Um, so it definitely shows how much time has impacted the town, um, changed people's minds and really um, progressed. It's unfortunate that we even had to get there, but I do think that, um, I, I guess I'm elated to see that we're finally getting there and I wish we could get there sooner, but you know, we'll take what we have. But thank you, thank you all so much for inviting me. All right, thank you so much, Amanda. Truly appreciate it. I think Vice President Ledbetter, you had your hand up. I want to make sure that I, I get your question and your thoughts. Um, hi, my I don't know if it's a question or more of a statement, but I do have a question within the statement to Dr. Jen Jenny. Um, I am a Dartmouth alum. I went to Dartmouth Public Schools my whole life. I am also partially Native American. I have found um, in my years of going to Dartmouth High that, that the mascot has never been explained to as to why, and there's never been any history behind why Dartmouth was named after um, a group of indigenous people. Um, at the time, we were not considered Native Americans. At the time, we were considered Indians, um, North American Indians. Um, but 
my question to you, Dr. Jane, is, is the school committee willing, the school board willing, to listen to any of the alumni that have attended there? Because when I graduated from Dartmouth High in 1984, um, there were probably six full, like maybe five full-blooded Native Americans, and then there was me. Um, but they were all together, probably like 11 minorities in the whole school. So there has never been any celebration or any um, inclusion in any other race within the Dartmouth Public Schools. And like I said, I went to Dartmouth Public Schools my whole life. I went to Dartmouth DeMello, and then the middle school and then the high school. So, and I'm very proud of my education, but it saddens me to see that the Dartmouth School Committee or the Dartmouth School Board doesn't have any respect for other, other people's culture. So, before you answer that, Dr. Jenkins, thank you, Renee. Before you answer that, is there anyone that has a question directly for Amanda before Dr. Jenkins answers? Vice President Ledbetter's uh, question. Is there any question directly for Amanda? Okay, if not, uh, Dr. Jenkins, please. So I'll say two things uh, to you, Renee. First about, I don't think, I don't know, I haven't lived in this town my entire life. Some people have, I can see on my Zoom, have, have been here much longer than me. and maybe know the answer to this question, but I don't think Dartmouth has always been the Indians. Um, I don't know when that mascot was adopted. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing Diane Gilbert, who's in the, has the Historical Society, and I know David Aarons does a lot of research, but I do not believe that we have been the Indians for, for I don't, I, there are, there are, however long we've had a mascot. I don't know the answer to that question. And so I don't, I think you're right. There's never been an explanation as to why that's our mascot. Um, I've seen some explanations that we adopted it because we inherited some things from Dartmouth College. So I don't fully know the answer to that question. And I do think it's a good question that, I mean, we should get rid of the mascot, but I think understanding our history is important, right? And so I think that's an important question. The other thing I will say is that, um, well, I guess there's two other things. Um, I think Amanda made a really good point that this is both a political issue and it's a moral issue, right? It's, it's, it's a moral issue. Um, and so I'm willing to listen, I'm here. I can't speak for the rest of the committee. Um, I would hope that they would be willing to listen. Um, but what I would hope to, to convince them because Sometimes, and I think the first time we went around on this issue, um, there was more people at the meeting saying, well, we've always done it this way, and this is a tradition. And I think you have to educate people that you have to do the right thing because it is not about how many votes are on this side or how many votes are on that side. It is about doing the right and the moral thing, right? To Amanda's point. And so, I would encourage people to participate and to show their opinion. That makes doing the moral thing easier for some people, right? Um, so that's a yes and no answer, I guess, right? I am willing to listen, I'm here. I hope my fellow school committee members are willing to listen. I can't give you that guarantee. I'm sorry, Renee, because I can only speak for myself. But I do encourage people to speak up and to state their opinions, because the more people who say they are against this, the easier it becomes for people to do the right thing. The last thing I want to say, sorry, Renee, is I agree with you. Um, Dartmouth is not very diverse. Um, as a result, that's what I mean by saying I think we have work to do. Um, I think there are some good things going on. You said you went to DeMello, um, Renee, and I'm really happy to report the Dartmouth Education Foundation just um, funded a grant um, around building this beautiful diversity library, but it's, it's just, they're gonna buy lots and lots of books and do a celebration of, of everyone's family and background. Um, there's a series of books about immigration and race and ethnicity and 
um, sexuality. And so we're, we're trying to do more and to be better, um, but we can always do even more and be even better. Um, this is part of what that diversity committee is. Um, I don't know what we're gonna decide in terms of membership and charge, but again, I left my email um, in the chat box. You can also contact Dr. Gifford and Mr. Oliver if you are um, willing to participate or help out on that committee, I encourage you to reach out. Um, and I do hope that we have some, lots of students, but also some alumni on that committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, Diane Gilbert or David Ahrens, do you wanna weigh in on when uh, according to your research or understanding, did the Dartmouth High School Indian come about? I'll take this first. I'm not from Dartmouth either. <laughs> so uh, my husband is actually the Dartmouth High School class of 1952. Uh, I don't believe there were Dartmouth Indians invoked at that time. I too have been interested in finding out when the Dartmouth School District decided to adopt uh, the Dartmouth Indian mascot and the logo. And someone said when she was in school in the 1960s, it was the Dartmouth Indians. And Shannon is correct when she said there was some sort of an interest at least in tying in Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire to uh, the Dartmouth School District. But as, uh, as has been reported many times, in 1974, Dartmouth College eliminated their, Dar you know, their Dartmouth Indian. So, uh, if anybody else who has a lot more history about being part of Dartmouth than I do, I'd love to know exactly when this transpired. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting to know, but the truth of the matter is, as we've all said in our own ways, this is a moral issue now that perhaps it's important to understand the history about how this came about and what the rationale was, but it's time in 2020 to get with the program and change. So can I, can I follow up on that too, that, that connection to Dartmouth College? I think Dartmouth College uses Big Green now, and at some point in time, Again, I don't have the records for this. This is all oral histories. Um, Dartmouth High was using Big Green or something like that. Um, and I was told that Dartmouth High was given, sent a letter from Dartmouth College to cease and desist using Big Green because we were infringing on the trademark of Dartmouth College. That's hearsay. Um, I don't know if that was a move to get away from that mascot when Dartmouth College did, but I was told that at some point in the history that happened. Um, I think yeah, that's, that's correct, because when I was in high school, um, that was something what we said was go big green, uh, and that was part of the cheer. So you, you are correct. There was a time when that was used um, as a phrase. I don't know about as a mascot. Thank you all. As, as it's 8.04, we'll round off in a, a couple minutes here. One of the things I do want to be clear on is just bring attention that some of the bills that uh, were being supported. So there were three bills that was the NAACP New Bedford branch was supporting, and I just put them in the chat. One was the resolve providing for the creation of a special commission relative to the seal and the model of the Commonwealth. And so you can see that that was sent in 1877 in the House 2776. Another bill was an act to ban the use of Native American mascots by public schools in the Commonwealth. That was sent in 247 in House 443. And another bill was an act to protect Native American heritage, uh, sent in 1811 in House 2948. Uh, we will certainly ask that you all make yourself familiar uh, with these bills. 
uh, happening at the highest level in our state. Uh, as many people have already said, it's important that our state legislator hear from us, just as it's important as our local uh, elected officials hear from us. Clearly, this is the time to have serious conversation around uh, these bills that I just put in the chat. I'd ask that you please make yourself familiar uh, with these bills as legislators have to hear from you. As you all know, not to uh, go too far from tonight's discussion, but there is large discussion around the police accountability bill that came out of the Senate that is now being debated in the House. And the point I'm trying to make is uh, when I've met with elected officials, uh, they talk about they need to hear from their constituents. One of the things that I've said as the leader of the NWCP New Bedford branch is that it's essential that you all hear from us, but it's also important that we know that you stand as a moral person. And I do feel that this is a moral issue. As we stand on the eve of where we lost titans in the civil rights movement, we talk about uh, John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, Joseph Lowry. We're at a moment where we must stand for something. And as John Lewis was very clear, we have to find a way to get in trouble. And so what I push back when I talk to certain representatives to say, yes, we need to hear from constituents, but where's your moral compass? Where's your moral compass to do what is right? So again, those bills are in the chat. I ask that you please make yourself familiar with those bills. I ask that you please write in or phone call. Certainly, I think Shannon made it very clear in the next week or so, there will be a school meeting at Dartmouth, I think you said on Monday, August 3rd. So we'll look forward to that. I do want to put on record that the NWCP New Bedford branch has reached out to Chris Oliver. We've asked for a seat on the diversity committee, as well as we've asked that there be a seat for a Native American indigenous communities as well. And so the response from Mr. Chris Oliver to me was that at this upcoming meeting, they're gonna discuss all those things. And I thanked him for that. And so there's a lot of discussion around this topic. The time is 8.07. Are there any other comments or questions from anybody at that time before we, at this time before we close? Any other comments or thoughts? John Lee, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to remark upon how, how compelling it was uh, to hear the testimony from the students, uh, particularly uh, young black women, because this is something that does not make sense to our peoples. It is something that, you know, it is it's racist behavior that is not like, it's not acceptable. We, we know, we know the pain, we know, you know, want to uh, participate in lateral violence. We are here to like stand together and to uplift each other, especially in the way in which uh, Amanda has done. Um, and we are very much, we are very much related um, as, as Ms. Ledbetter has, uh, has acknowledged. So, you know, I, I definitely want to, you know, just, just hold uh, how compelling it was to hear from, uh, hear from the students and the alumni on this matter. Thank you, wonderful. I have a quick thing. I also have a quick question for Laurel and Jean-Luc, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Kate. No, go ahead, go ahead Kate, and then go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm with the Dartmouth Week. I just wanted to ask about um, whether you feel that erasure is a potential issue, because I did hear from um, Tribal Chairwoman Cheryl Andrews Maltese, and she brought that up as well. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, really quickly. Um, so we are at a point where we are focusing a, a critical issue of data equity on the state level. In regards to COVID-19, the Department of Public Health is not reporting American Indian Alaska Native cases uh, within the Commonwealth. Those aren't distinguished uh, of, the, of the racial and ethnic data that is, um, that is collected. We're also having to do public education campaigns on how to respond to the Census 2020 because if people uh, mark that they are American Indian and one other ethnicity, then they are placed into a multicultural bucket. Uh, so we've had to very explicitly tell our community members to only put American Indian and, and their tribal affiliation 
uh, regardless of whether they are uh, Black or, or Latino as well, uh, which, which definitely there's, there's erasure on, on all levels. Um, but the, that's, those are some of the critical issues. So when we're talking about visibility, we're not just like trying to protect, to rally around these, these symbols, but we're also trying to have those, those structural issues of visibility um, answered. And Laurel, if you have like any other. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't um, interpret the, the, I don't know what Kate meant about invisibility, but I'm gonna answer that a different way. Um, but I want to go back to um, uh, Jean-Luc's comment about um, other students of color. Um, there's one study that kind of makes all of our, all of the researchers mouth jaw um, in shock because it showed that exposure to native mascots um, increases stereotyping of Asian Americans. And like nobody really understands why that occurred in the study, but it, it suggests that kind of when one group is stereotyped, it can affect other groups, in this case, other students of color. Um, so uh, there's this theoretical framework that's you to go on the erasure part. Maybe this is related to what Kate was talking about. So there's two issues that Native people face in U.S. mainstream culture in terms of their representation. One is invisibility, okay? Um, there's this incredible underrepresentation of Native people in education curriculum and in media, especially contemporary Native people. Everything's historical. That's one of the stereotypes of Native people, right? Um, and even the historical stuff is misleading most of the time. Um, in, in K through 12 schools, for the, the states that have curriculum required on Native issues, 87% of what's covered in the schools is prior to 1900. There's been a ton of things that have happened related to Native history and Native contemporary lives that happened after 1900, right? Um, so invisibility is a huge problem. Um, my, in my own study that's currently under review, basically people, white people and, well, non-Native people, I should say, they can't make, name contemporary Native people that they know of, famous contemporary Native people, and they name people who are actually aren't Native, okay? Um, and so invisibility is one problem. The other problem is related to the mascot issue. The other problem is stereotyping, right? And like misrepresentation, inaccurate information, okay? And so the mascot issue and, and Columbus Day and that kind of thing, is about misrepresentation, right? And problematic messages. People simultaneously need to work on increasing accurate and diverse representations of Native people in the schools and in the media. Um, uh, and it, once that happens, it will actually be helpful in reducing the stereotyping and the misinformation. But um, these are kind of two things going on. And related to Kate's comment, a lot of people, you know, say things like, well, if we don't have the Native mascots, well, Native people will be invisible, right? Um, but we don't want a visibility that is misleading and educationally unsound, right? So we need to get rid of that stuff, but increase the, the accurate stuff. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we saw a question from Raquel Halsey. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Raquel? Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm actually the executive director for the North American Indian Center of Boston, and, and, and uh, I've been listening in. But uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation. Uh, my peoples are from the Plains, and I also uh, grew up in, the, in Maryland. Um, and I was touched and infuriated uh, listening to the two young, strong black women uh, who, who experienced uh, ha having been forced into, or excuse me, they, what their experiences tell me are that the adults, the 
adults in their communities uh, are failing to protect them, not only from, um, from negative imagery, but also from the very real violence that happens uh, and the threats that happen when women of color speak up. And, and there's nothing more disgusting because I've, I've also personally experienced that time and time again, uh, being both an advocate against uh, native mascots and, and many other issues. But, um, but to, uh, just to be clear, I also wanted to make sure that everyone who is listening in also understands that the, the motion that Alexia was describing is uh, a way that the US um, pop culture and, and political folks over, over hundreds of years now have, um, have turned our people into a caric caricature uh, because they could not imitate uh, some of the sounds and our languages that we use. So that is what that pretend war whoop is supposed to um, is supposed to signify, and so even as even as a cheerleader, you know, this young woman is is supposed to be taking pride in her community and her peers, in what she's doing, in in the work that she's putting forth in the world, and and she's being forced to participate in the erasure of an entire group of people who was here before the settlers arrived. So Kate, when you're, when you're asking about erasure, that's the real erasure, is killing our peoples, forcing us into reservation systems, erasing us and our histories from the schools, very physically forcing us into residential schools where the, where the work was to save, to, to save the man and kill the Indian, and then, at the end of the day, to turn us into a cartoon and to diminish us and our language into a simple sound that we're expecting our children to use during a football game or, or another sports event. And that's, that's something that we cannot accept any longer. We're, we're 500 years plus into this erasure. So I hope that people continue to truly fight for this, contact your legislators and, and continue to do the work of actually connecting to real history and real peoples who are very much alive today. Yeah, and I wanted to pick up uh, definitely on the diminishing of, of native, uh, of indigenous languages um, at, a, at a point where we are reclaiming and revitalizing our languages and our knowledge bases, which are critical uh, because right now our traditional ecological knowledge is needed to combat the broader discussions um, but the harm uh, that is introduced when it comes to all of the aspects around these caricatures, these stereotypes, it, it, it's, related, it's related to the way that we treat our women. It's related to the way that we treat our planet. Uh, it's related to the way in which we value um, indigenous um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color's uh, ways of knowing. Uh, so definitely, you know, this is something that it's, it's very much interrelated. And I, and I, I thank Raquel for, for jumping in the conversation for that. So maybe you can add one thing in response to Kate's comment as well. Sorry, I know LaSalle is trying, you're trying to get us out of here, I know that. But um, I will also say that I believe um, your source that you referred to is a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and she is also a graduate of Dartmouth High. Um, you've heard from several members of other tribes here as well, as well as uh, I believe Ms. Ledbetter is also um, a Dartmouth 
Hi, Native. And I would encourage you and the other journalists here um, to reach out to the tribes for whom this land is their tribal land to get their opinion too, and to not just listen to the people. Um, thank you, uh, Brooke, uh, the Quinna tribe, I'm sorry. Um, and to not just listen only to the people who contact you, because I think there are other voices to be heard in this debate um, that have not been incorporated in this debate. And I would encourage, um, I've been trying to do some of that work, but I would also encourage those journalists that are here on this call with us to do that work as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all so much. I certainly want to again uh, thank uh, Jean-Luc, um, and the North American Indian Center of Boston. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your comments. Thank you, Dr. Shannon Jen Jenkins, Amanda Kufo, Dr. Laurel Davis Delano, and then Alexa Ash. I appreciate all of our panelists. Certainly want to again, thank those who helped to put this program together. Uh, uh, Gretchen uh, Baker-Smith, David Ahrens, Dr. Janet Freeman, uh, Diane Gilbert, Elizabeth Murphy, uh, Michael Watson and Brooke Worley, certainly thank you. Certainly thank the New Bedford Immigrant Support Network. And always, I share in this work with my Vice President, Renee Ledbetter, thank you for your leadership and thank everyone who is a member of the NAACP New Bedford branch. Again, you'll be able to find a recording of this on the NAACP New Bedford uh, branch website. Thank you all for your comments. Thank you all for your time. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. I didn't say hello. Hi, Char. Hi, Ann. Hi, thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thanks, Kate, for being here. Hi, Amy, if I didn't say hello. Hi, Ronnie. I didn't get a chance to say hello. I feel bad. All these people I didn't get a chance to say hello to. Thanks. David, are you still there? I am. Are you still recording? Yeah, I stopped the recording. I think I stopped the recording. I should have stopped the recording.